now we have started recording it. Uh, so we'd like to inform you that the meeting is being recorded and your continuing participation implies consent for the recording. Uh, to ensure the meeting runs smoothly and to respect others, uh, please make sure your microphone is on mute all the times except uh, when you are invited to speak. Um, you can use the chat function to post your comments and questions throughout. We will monitor the chat and respond to you all. And uh, during the Q&A session, if you wish to speak, please raise your hand using the Zoom icon uh, from the reactions in the toolbar. And in case of any technical difficulties, please post a message to us in the chat, okay? Uh, so before starting today's webinar, I would like to uh, take a minute or two to quickly give you an overview of the activities uh, we, the audiology team of the Department of Disability Studies have prepared for World Hearing Day. This year, we are collaborating with the World Health Organization and IATI Center for Children with Developmental Disabilities to spread the theme for this year on maintaining good hearing across the life by means of hearing loss prevention through safe listening. Um, we started by launching an awareness campaign through the social media, where we shared posters, short videos, and informational posts. On uh, 28th February, we conducted an awareness program at a public place in Colombo and a hearing screening program for the academic support staff of the Faculty of Medicine, University of Kalania, which uh, will be continued today and tomorrow. Um, so uh, for tomorrow, we have organized a special program on safe listening uh, with a hearing screening and a set of listening activities for the young adults and adults with autism spectrum disorder and Down syndrome at IIT Center. Um, I also invite all of you to watch the Pathikada program of Sirius TV channel for a talk on World Hearing Day and Safe Listening by uh, Ms. Dinukshi Leperuma, a senior lecturer of our department. Okay, so let's move on to today's activity. Let me introduce the webinar speakers, Prof. Uh, David Welsh and Ms. Eranti Liana Duva. So, uh, Professor David Welsh is the head of the audiology at the University of Auckland. Uh, his research interests are hearing health promotion, screening for hearing loss, uh, the impact of noise on health, soundscapes, uh, the role of cochlear implants in human outcomes um, and community hearing health issues. He currently teaches auditory physiology, auditory behaviors, neural underpinnings, and noise-induced hearing loss. He has held government advisory roles in hearing screening and workplace health and safety and serves on many boards and committees. Ms. Eranti Liana Dua is a lecturer in audiology at the Department of Disability Studies, Faculty of Medicine, University of California. And she completed her bachelor's in audiology and master's in public health in epidemiology uh, from University of California. Eranti is currently a doctoral candidate in audiology and health promotion at School of Population Health, University of Auckland, New Zealand. Um, Eranti's research interests include uh, noise-induced hearing loss and behavior changing health promotion. So Professor Welsh and Eranti, thank you so much for taking your time from your busy schedule to prepare uh, today's presentation. Hello everyone, thank you for joining us with this today's presentation. The topic and the two of us are going to
And the two of us are going to be presenting today. And sitting on my right is Eranti Lianadua Kankanamge. She's a lecturer in audiology at the University of Kelania. And she's also doing her PhD with me at the University of Auckland here in New Zealand. And the two of us are going to be presenting today. And sitting on my right is Eranti Lianadua Kankanamge. She's a lecturer in audiology at the University of Kelania. And she's also doing her PhD with me at the University of Auckland here in New Zealand. And the two of us are going to be presenting today. And sitting on my right is Eranti Lianadua Kankanamge. She's a lecturer in audiology at the University of Kelania. And she's also doing her PhD with me at the University of Auckland here in New Zealand. And uh, this is Professor David Welch, my uh, supervisor throughout my uh, PhD. And uh, he's a senior lecturer at uh, University of Auckland, New Zealand, in section of audiology. So the World Health Organization has estimated that around about half a billion people in the world have significant degree of hearing loss. Now, that's an awful lot of people. And of those, about one in six, we think, is due to noise. If you do the maths, that makes about 70 million people in the world with hearing loss, with noise-induced hearing loss. So we think it's a pretty major issue. Therefore, uh, for today's talk, we thought of having, uh, having an outline like this. So we'll uh, alternatively talk through the topics. First, we'll be talking about how uh, sounds or noise can damage your ear and hearing. You can uh, get exposed to many levels of like different sound uh, noises, loud noises uh, through different exposures. It can be workplace related exposures or we'll be referring it as occupational noise exposure. Or else it can be like leisure time or recreational activities like uh, listening to loud music through headphones or listening to loud uh, sound while playing video games or uh, attending to uh, like very noisy concerts or even it can be through religious activities. Uh, can be It can be in temples, uh, mosques or church. So make sure that when you are like uh, exposing to loud sounds, this can damage your hearing. So, uh, the hearing loss resulted from noise is referred as noise-induced hearing loss, and it can be happen in many ways. Uh, even it can be happen as a sudden, uh, like a single minute exposure to very loud sounds, or it can be happen or built up over time. So how would you experience uh, that if you're in case if you're ha having a hearing loss, how would you experience that? Uh, you will see that uh, there's a uh, differentiation in your hearing sensitivity. Obviously, it, it is a negative change in your hearing sensitivity. So at the beginning, it can be temporary. The change of hearing sensitivity can be temporary. And later on, if you're kind of exposing to uh, continuously exposing to loud sounds, it can get permanent. For an example, like, like let's say you will not uh, be, you will not feel that or you will not experience that you will be able to hear the sounds that you used to hear with the same volume. You might have to increase the uh, volume of the TV or the phone while you are having a conversation with someone. And uh, this one, this graph, we call it uh, as an audiogram. It's a result of uh, like Piotr audiometry. So in the first one, I'm not going into the details of the audiogram, but uh, in this blue area, the top area, we'll refer like if somebody's hearing uh, sensitivity is falling within this blue area, we call them as uh, having normal hearing. But like uh, in case if your hearing sensitivity is reduced, this can fall and be uh, beyond the blue area. There you can experience a certain degree of difficulty uh, to hear. 
but with the exposure let's say you are being exposed to uh, noise continuously this can further damage uh, and your uh, hearing sensitivity can be like uh, negatively fallen down into this green area where you experience a significant amount of hearing loss hearing sensitivity now let's see that uh, how this damage can happen at your ear levels obviously you can't see the structures in the ear this is a uh, this is a microscopic picture of your inner ear and it has uh, like tiny tiny little cells which will uh, help you to convert the sound energy from the environment and uh, you will be able to process at the brain level we call them as hair cells little tiny tiny hair cells so what will happen uh, you can see what will happen in the next picture with the noise exposure at the beginning they will uh, stay intact like normal but with the continuous exposure it will get damaged as you can see see uh, like in the first picture we have like fine uh, fine tuned rows of uh, like little hair cells with u and v shapes but later on with the exposure like it's very disorganized and you can't even see the flow so that that is what will happen with the continuous noise exposure and if you still continue uh, with the exposure so uh, initially it will get damaged but later on it will disappear so once it's gone once the hair cells are gone it is gone forever that means your hearing is gone for ever so uh, we all are mammals like you we, we all are humans and so we are falling under the category of mammals so these tiny uh, hair cells like sensory cells cannot get recovered or cannot uh, get healed in mammals so that means our hearing will not recover if you uh, if you if your hair cells get damaged so the only thing that we can do is to replicate what you had previously like let's say your uh, leg is broken you will be using crutches to walk but still it will not function as your working legs right prof david mm. and then like it's the same thing with hearing loss as well so you will be asked to wear a hearing aid uh, to replicate the function that you had previously but according to the current level of the research still will not be able to replicate what you had previously your normal hearing will not be able to replicate so it's just an like a supportive supporting thing so which which leaves us with the only option of uh, prevention prevention of uh, getting exposed to loud noises or sounds so then we'll refer that prevention is the only cure for noise induced hearing loss so thank you aranthi it's very interesting fascinating stuff what goes inside the goes on inside the ear isn't it <clears throat> and now we're going to change take a little bit keep all that in mind but i'm going to tell you about how our societies treat loud sound well in general we seem to think that loud is good a lot of people seem to feel that the louder things are, the more fun they are, the more exciting they are. This is just a, a very quick Google search. Um, some, some of the sorts of picture that you, you see when you look at loud sound. And it's, um, you can see there's a, a lot of excitement in this. Um, there's this woman with her hair, she looks very happy, doesn't she? She's sort of um, laughing or very happy, but her, her head's on fire because she's listening to such loud music. Or these, um, statements like welcome to our happy crazy fun loud home so the notion of loudness gets associated with all these good fun concepts in in our societies while on the other hand when you try and ask people to be quiet or, or um, to, to reduce the sound level there's this negativity about it it's a sort of a an absence of fun if you like um, I've used the word officious here, so it sounds like someone telling you. And again, just a Google search on, on quiet, and it's things like a, a picture of a policeman trying to stop you, these very officious signs, no excessive noise, quiet here. 
this poor woman with her head bound up in rope to, to try and stop her making sound, or this little man here putting up a poster saying, quiet please, while everyone's enjoying themselves, having fun. So the, the two ways of thinking about the world are quite different from each other. And it's that, that somehow we, we have to address. So I've tried to summarize that in this, this slide where um, we've got the initial problem, um, which is preventing noise-induced hearing loss and preventing that damage that Aranthi showed us um, from, from taking place. While at the same time, we've got these societal messages that I've shown you, which become internalized. And when we internalize things, it means that we, we take them inside our mind and we start to see them as normal, which I think is the case with loud noise. People see loud noise being fun and therefore normal. And so it's very hard to convince people that they're doing something wrong if it's normal to them, and, and especially if it's fun to them. So when you try to give people messages about try not to damage your ears, try and protect your hearing, I think people switch off at that point. And I've got this nice little little cartoon, um, someone you, you may recognize, a very wise man whose statement, just because I don't care doesn't mean I don't understand. So people like Aranthi and I can educate um, others as much as we like, and even if they understand what we're saying, they often won't care about it because it goes against what they see as the norm. It goes against what they accept as a normal way of doing things. But that's very strange. If you think about it, that we live in a society which treats as normal something that causes damage to our bodies. It's a, it's a strange thing, and we want to understand why. Why would that be? Well, that's what the next part of today's talk is going to be about. I'm going to tell you about some um, theory we developed based on research on why people like loud sound. We interviewed a whole lot of people, um, and one of the very common statements that people made when we said, why do you like loud sound? They say, it's fun. And then we started to explore, well, why? Why do you think it's fun? So the people, um, we're, sorry, so the, the, the theory is that in our evolution, our auditory pathways extended not just to take information about sound up to our cortex to tell us what the sounds mean, but also they extend to the areas in our brain which process emotion. And we think that's because sounds are so meaningful and important in our survival. So if, if a sound is a threat of a um, tiger growling, it's a very scary sound, it has to get through to our emotional system very quickly so that we're afraid of it and we, we run away or whatever it might be. And we expect, we believe, that that's why sound has such an emotional impact on people. Now it's really why we enjoy listening to music so much and why sounds influence us so, as much as they do. So to explore this theory a bit more, we interviewed a whole lot of people and we chose people who know about loud sounds. So, we focused on people who either go to or work in nightclubs because we know they're places where people go when they want to listen to loud music. So we interviewed people who are regular um, club attendees, who, who that's what part of their, their sort of recreational time. We also interviewed musicians and DJs who work in um, clubs who play very loud music to people and the managers of the clubs who control, if you like, the, the sound level that people are experiencing and witness the, the kind of noise exposure that club goers have. And we came up with this model, which it looks pretty complicated, and it is kind of complicated, but what I'm going to do for you now is to break it down into its constituent parts to try and explain how it works. Um, essentially, it starts with loud sound, the loud music being played in the nightclubs. Now, we know that in general, if you take a, a little child and play very loud music to it, a child will put their hands over their ears. They, they'll feel uncomfortable by it. And we all do, at first at least. We, we feel this sense of discomfort when we're exposed to loud sounds. However, our auditory system is very, very complex. And Aranthi, you've shown us how yeah. the auditory system works just before. Well. What we didn't talk about was how adaptive the auditory system is. When we go into a very loud place, 
imagine or cast your mind back perhaps the last time you went into a nightclub or a, a loud party where the music's really loud and people are having lots of fun perhaps the, as you walk in the sound hits you and it seems very very loud but the longer you're there for the more your auditory system adapts to that loud sound and so gradually you start to tolerate it gradually you start to accept that okay it's loud but I've got used to it now and that component, I think, is very, very important. The fact that our auditory systems adapt to the loud sound so it doesn't seem as loud is an important component in all of this. This graph shows you the result of some research that we did in nightclubs around Auckland City in New Zealand. Uh, along the horizontal axis here is the time of day from nine o'clock in the evening through to about two in the morning. And on the vertical axis here is the level, the sound level. Now, I should explain to you that 85 decibels, this is the legal limit for workplaces to have uh, the legal sound level before the employer is required to provide hearing protection for his workers. Um, and around about nine o'clock in the evening, that's about how loud the sound levels in nightclubs are. And then through the course of the evening, the sound levels gradually get louder and louder up till about midnight when they seem to level off. Now, we believe that this gradual increase in the loudness, which of course is controlled by the staff of the nightclub, is really driven by the de their developing tolerance for the loud sounds. So they gradually turn the volume up on the, the sound levels as their own hearing adapts to the sound around them so that the sound gets louder and louder through the evening. But loud sound doesn't just cause that discomfort. It also causes these other things that people find beneficial. Um, it, it masks unwanted sound. Um, and here we interviewed people to, to understand what that means. Um, th people said things like it blocks out life and noise. It distracts you from other sounds going on around you. So we all live in noisy places and loud music can block that. It can and give us something to listen to that's perhaps more pleasant. The second point here was around this idea of social cohesion. Um, loud music puts you in the mood to drink when you're with your mates. So in New Zealand, there's a big drinking culture. People, when they're with their friends, they want to drink alcohol and, and have fun. And loud music seems to support that, according to this quote. Or another quote from somebody else, everyone wants to be part of an experience, especially when it's music and share it with each other. Loud music makes you feel as one. And this is a uh, an experience I can relate to when I've been at, say, loud music concerts or in nightclubs. There are people around me who I don't know, but because we're all experiencing the same loud music, you feel somehow together with the other people around you. And so it, it pro produces this idea of social cohesion, of a, a sense of friendliness, I suppose, with those around you. And then even beyond that, um, it, it can be seen as an opportunity for, for intimacy, for for sort of interpersonal intimacy with, with people, even though you're in a crowded room. And we had quotes where people said things like, loud music in clubs past midnight gives them, the, the people who are in the club, an excuse not to talk to people and instead be intimate. So one of the things that loud music does, it means that you have to move physically very close to each other in order to, to talk or communicate in any way. And so it, it gives people that opportunity. Or another quote was, other people can't hear intimate conversations so that you still have, uh, you can have a lot of people in close proximity, but it's still private. So if you want to talk to somebody who perhaps you've just made friends with in the, the, the nightclub, you can do that in a way that's private that other people around you can't hear because of this loud, loud music that's going on around you. So these are, are some of the positive aspects of um, the loud sound. And we think of them as external in the sense that they're external to you as an individual. They're about masking sounds around you or bringing you closer to the other people around you. Then there are also these other benefits of loud sound that are internal, that are something that goes on inside your own mind. Um, there's masking of unwanted thoughts was one of the ideas that people brought up. Uh, it's escapism. You lose yourself in the music. It makes you forget about the other things, everyday problems and stuff. So perhaps if you're feeling worried about something in your life. Listening to loud music seems to help people forget about that. And I suppose the loud music itself overwhelms those thoughts. 
I can relate to that. I think I've had that experience myself where I've been worried about something. Some loud music playing distracts me, makes me just focus on that music. There's also this idea of adoption of a cool or tough identity associated with listening to loud music. Here's somebody, they talk about their brother. My brother likes listening to loud music because he thinks he's cool. And certainly that there's that association between loud music and cool. You think of rock stars. They're, they're cool people, right? They're, they're cool, they're tough, nothing upsets them. And the loud music seems to promote that idea in people's minds as well. And then the, the third of these internal benefits of listening to loud sound is that it, it, it arouses us, it makes us feel excited. Um, they, listen, listening to loud music makes me feel happy and energized. I want to turn it up even louder. Or the loud beat makes you want to move your body, be more active. It makes you want to get up and dance. When you're in this club and there's loud music playing, it, it, it makes you feel thrilled and excited. So there's a whole lot of benefits of loud music that, that really make people want, want to listen to it more. And that process is of, of all of these benefits associated with the loud music is really one of conditioning. You'll probably be familiar with conditioning if you've ever read anything about psychology. The idea that if you repeatedly pair some beneficial thing with, with something else, you you start to develop a, a desire for that, that, that something else. So all of these benefits, internal and external, being paired with loud sound starts to condition people to want the loud sound. Um, and we, again, we had quotes relating to that. I think maybe they like it because it's fun and it's associated with fun. You see how that's kind of circular logic. People want the music because it's fun, and it's fun because it's associated with fun, with other fun times perhaps they've had in the past. So it's this almost this circular, and you can see it in the diagram here, this circular conditioning process that brings together the loud sound with all these fun things. Um, and this other person, this other quote, says it translates into fun and happy memories. Every time you hear that sound again, the loud music, it conjures up those feelings again. It can change your mood wherever you are. So perhaps if you're feeling a bit down, play some loud music, it brings back all these nice memories, you feel happy again. And it's again a conditioning to enjoy the loud music. And so all of that, we think, contributes to a desire for loud sound. If, if you've got this thing that can make you feel better, you, you, you generally start to want it. Now, it's not always the case. And we know that different personality factors can come into this. Some people just hate loud music, no matter what you do. They'll never get to the point where they've been conditioned because they, they won't listen to the loud music enough. But for many people, loud music is seen as this desirable thing because of this conditioning process. So now we've got these two factors, the, the desire for loud sound um, due to this conditioning, and the tolerance for loud sound that happens due to this auditory adaptation. And together, they produce this, what we've called an acculturation of loud music, a sort of a, an acceptance of loud music as normal and desirable, especially in an environment like a nightclub. And that led to quotes like, it needs to be loud at nightclubs. Everyone expects it. It's what they go for. It's what they go to the nightclub for. They, they, they're going to the nightclub. They want the loud music because of these various benefits that it brings. And so therefore, the people who run the nightclubs, or the entertainment venues, as we've called it in this diagram, they, they're thinking of a, of a whole lot of factors that are present in the entertainment venue, that the reason why people go there. There's music, there's fun, there's friendship, which can possibly extend a little bit beyond that. Um, there, there are, there's alcohol and some other types of drugs, potentially, and there's dancing, all of which people find enjoyable and all of which are reasons why people like going to nightclubs. And so therefore, if you're running a nightclub, well, those, all of those benefits contribute to the conditioning that we were talking about before, associations with loud sound. It's not just these direct factors associated with loud sound, but also these other things that go on in the nightclubs. But also, therefore, the people who run the entertainment venues will tend to present their music at high levels to create this, this, um, this loop, if you like. And you can see that the whole system here is essentially, it's a big circle, isn't it? It's actually, it's several circles. It's circles within circles. 
because you start with the loud sound and then all of these things promote the people having fun and enjoying it and wanting more loud sound, which of course the nightclubs give them. And so you get this very, very powerful conditioning process that goes on to make people want to listen to loud music and want it more and more. Fascinating stuff. Aranti. Uh, now I think you have a better idea of what is going inside your mind and brain when you're exposed to loud sounds. Uh, your mind and brain will still say that like uh, it's fun, it's engaged uh, with this. But as I was telling you previously, once it's gone, it's uh, gone forever. So we should take uh, necessary actions towards safe listening. There comes our uh, program called Dangerous Decibels. As I was telling you earlier, so what we have to do, uh, I, I know that we have to listen to our mind and brain sometimes, but in this case, for uh, recreational and uh, like loud noises, we have to uh, like take it as a certain level of top. And then uh, we might have to modify our behaviors around how we react uh, around loud sounds and noises. Therefore, like we ultimately, that means we had to train ourselves, train our behaviors, uh, like how to respond, how to react if you uh, encounter uh, that sort of a situation. There comes our like program called Dangerous Decibels uh, with an end goal of uh, reducing uh, the level of noise induced hearing loss and tinnitus. Obviously, you might have heard of uh, tinnitus. It's uh, the ringing sensation of the ears without any external uh, factors. So uh, you can get tinnitus as a result of uh, severe noise exposure. So this program, Dangerous Decibels, is a quite fun and interactive and engaging program which have like a bit of activities uh, which will uh, guide you through a certain level of behavior change. So this is a picture of uh, dangerous decibels while uh, we were running at uh, the program at New Zealand schools. And uh, it's approximately run for 45 minutes. So it, this program will teach uh, through about first about the sounds and how the ear works uh, when, we, when you are exposed to sounds. And how do you like, how do you experience, how do you feel when you have a hearing loss? And obviously, uh, the uh, dangerous about dangerous noise sources because you have to be aware of these are the potential do dangerous noise sources. And then uh, it will teach you a few simple steps uh, to protect your hearing from those dangerous noise exposures, uh, such as moving away from the sound source or fitting earplugs. And it will teach you to look after. I know it will teach you to look after yourself, but it will encourage you to look after your friends as well. These are the simple messages, three simple messages uh, come across through Dangerous Decibels program. First one is uh, turn down the volume. In case if you are listening to music, I, I, I'm going to take the example of listening to music. In case if you are listening to music, if it's in your control, you can turn the volume down. Like I know that your mind and brain will tell you, as Professor David was explaining about the conditioning process, that you need to increase it for fun. But uh, like you have to take actions for yourself if you want to protect and preserve your hearing for your life. So you make actions to take a like. It's a simple step, step uh, turn down the volume. And if you can't do that, if it's out of your control, you can walk away, like uh, you can uh, move away from the sound source. Uh, that will uh, minimize the exposure. Or else, if you can't do both, both the steps, you have to protect yourself using hearing protective devices. So those are the three simple steps of uh, three simple messages of dangerous decibels uh, in terms of protecting, your, protecting your, your hearing. Turn down the volume, walk away, and protect your ears. And uh, initially, this, ha this program has been developed for children, 
but uh, we have adapted this program for adults. It has the same basic components as I was telling you earlier with the same level of interactivity and the same length, approximately 45 minutes. But the examples uh, and the demonstration has been adapted according to the levels of uh, like workplace exposures, which will give more sense. This is a picture of administering dangerous decibels program at uh, one of the workplaces. This program has been administered at that workplace tea room. And here you can see the demonstration of hair cells, how the normal hair cells and how it has been damaged over like certain level of noise exposure. And uh, this time, uh, the program has uh, administered at the car park and the uh, workers at that certain occupational setup has been listening and being trained uh, at their car park. And lastly, uh, we have trained the New Zealand Army uh, about, the, about how to protect their hearing from noise during their induction course. So far now, I think you uh, will be able to remember those three simple steps. Uh, but uh, the thing is, uh, it's better not to be late to preserve what you have. So make sure you are taking necessary actions to preserve what you have in terms of, of your hearing. So the next thing what we could do is uh, to uh, make you aware about the uh, application certain mobile applications available to protect like uh, to monitor the noise levels and hearing your hearing level so we'll I'll be talking through about noise uh, hearing and noise apps available for mobiles the first one is the Neosh app uh, which is more com which is compatible with Apple phones you can download the uh, that uh, noise monitoring app through this link and this one uh, decibel x is the android uh, accessible app for android phones so these two uh, through these two apps you will be able to monitor the noise exposure and for hearing uh, monitoring you can uh, follow the link and download the app for hear who it's a screening test provided by world health organization so ultimately you can have an idea about uh, your hearing level over to you Dr. david thanks Aranti. so this is really just a, a summary slide uh, just to go over what we've told you in our talk Aranti's explained to you how um, that your hearing gets damaged if you listen to loud sounds and she showed you those microscope photographs of your hair cells being battered by by the loud sounds so that they die and that they don't come back. We've talked to you about loud sounds being quite common um, in your workplaces but also even in recreational time and even in religious activities you're not your ears aren't necessarily safe from loud sounds so it's a good idea to to listen out for them. Um, I've, I talked to you quite a lot about how loud sounds and especially music seem to be treated as fun and good in our society and how that makes us perhaps underestimate the danger that we're in when we're exposed to them because they can indeed still cause injury to our ears. It doesn't matter how much we enjoy that song we're listening to, if it's loud enough it'll still damage our hearing. And so as Aranthi's just explained to you, if you listen safely if perhaps you just turn the level down a little bit, or you move away from the speaker when it's playing very loudly, you can keep your hearing and keep it intact all your life. And I hope, having listened to us now, that you'll uh, do that. As Dr. David was saying, we uh, do hope that you will take necessary actions from now on uh, towards preserving what you have through safe listening. Uh, and thank you very much for your attention. Uh, if you have any questions, you can uh, contact uh, both of us through the emails. And uh, we were quite enjoying uh, talking through this presentation. Thank you very much. Bye.
Thank you so much, uh, Professor Welsh and Eranti, for that uh, interesting and uh, informative presentation. Um, so we don't have uh, any questions in the chat, but uh, we do have a few minutes uh, left. Uh, so if the audience have any questions, you can um, uh, take the flow now. Hi, Prof. David and Ms. Eranti. I hope two of you can hear me. Uh, this is Vidalini. So uh, uh, we have two questions to ask from you. Uh, the first question is about uh, the dangerous decibel program uh, that you two are going to initiate for different populations. So uh, we would like to ask that, how did you monitor uh, whether they're going to continue on using the strategies that you two going to initiate during the program? Uh, we would like to know about that. Uh, Iranti, shall I answer that or would you like to? Uh, Prof, uh, if you would uh, like to answer, you can uh, go with that. If I, if I want to add anything, I'll add. Sounds good. Okay, well, yeah. I... Uh, it's it's a very good question. We uh, you know we we do all this training and we we want to know that it works. Well, in the past we've used a questionnaire that was developed by an American group, the group who first developed the Dangerous Death Spells program, and that questionnaire was quite good and it certainly showed that the training, the Dangerous Death Spells training, had a long term effect. But Irati has been working on as part of her PhD a new questionnaire which is designed to be much more effective and more sensitive to changes after the dangerous death spells program so in fact you are your question is at the cutting edge of science and Aranthi is is the one who's driving that work is that fair to say Aranthi? Uh, hello I, I hope you can hear me yeah uh, I think uh, Prof David has given a fair uh, like uh, a good answer so uh, what I can tell about like if I want to add uh, something more like uh, even in the program we are talking about behavior changes obviously uh, the behavior changes has been uh, monitored through a different uh, health promotion approach but the thing that we are doing right now the, uh, we have changed it uh, according to the uh, most uh, current behavior changing approaches so uh, we are going to monitor the uh, changes of the behavior through that new approach All right, uh, thank you very much for the explanation. And the next question is about, uh, uh, I mean, the way that the program has initiated. So we would like to know that whether uh, you are about to introduce regulations to the government about how to uh, uh, kind of uh, regulating the noise sources in recreational venues and other occupational related noise exposure kind of uh, uh, informing the relevant stakeholders and uh, initiating regulations for that so any initiations from that side yeah that's another good question um, <clears throat> there there aren't really regulations about re recreational noise exposure because the government doesn't like to interfere with people's um, recreational time so it's it, it doesn't i don't think there's an interest from the government to do that um but i think the, the approach that we're trying to take is educating children in schools so that hopefully they've got this understanding of the vulnerability of their ears and so as they grow up they're perhaps less likely to want to to risk their hearing or at least when they do risk their hearing they they do it in um in more measured ways or they, they do it with a full understanding um, but yeah, it's a, it's a very difficult question, that one, because it's, 
it's tied up with you know human freedom to to do do what we want to and i i, I wouldn't feel comfortable having a law saying people couldn't listen to music loudly if they if they wished um i, I don't know I, what do other people think about that Durante, what do you think I think uh, it's the same because when it uh, with, with the personal space, especially with the recreational noise sources, uh, it's actually people's choice. Mm. But uh, like uh, even I think from in New Zealand, there's a noise. There are noise regulation after ten o'clock, right? Like uh, they can't disturb. Uh, what uh, I think you can explain uh, more about that. No, that's a different type of noise regulation. Now that's about disturbing people when they're trying to sleep or, or that kind of thing. Yeah. It's not talking about preventing noise induced hearing loss. So if someone's listening through headphones, for example, they could be playing at a very high level and doing a lot of damage to themselves. Yeah, I think uh, we have another question from the chat. Uh, it's again, uh, it's from Nuan. He's asking about uh, regulations, uh, uh, norms and suggestions to address religious noise exposures. You, you, you have a go at answering that, Arantia. Can... There's a few questions in the chat, actually. Yeah. <laughs> can you answer it, Arantia? Uh, according to the current regulation, I think if, uh, if Ms. Dinukshi wants to add uh, anything to this conversation, uh, feel free to add because it's her area as well. Uh, I, uh, I, while we were uh, present, while we were making the presentation, also I, I was telling you about the re religious choice, uh, like uh, like exposures in uh, Sri Lanka, especially at uh, temples and mosques, uh, because uh, because it's kind of a sensitive area that people can't uh, like really touch, touch base on. It's not a personal thing. So basically, uh, uh, according to my current knowledge, we don't have uh, much of regulations to control those sort of uh, religious noise exposure where we should address in the future, definitely. Mm. Yeah, it's an interesting thought, isn't it? Because people, um need to be able to worship i suppose one way is to speak to the priest or speak to the um the authorities in the temple or church and and, and ask them if, if you really think the levels are very loud but it's obviously a delicate area you know whenever we talk about religion people feel very strongly often about it so it's a it's a tricky one i noticed there's another question about using noise cancelling headphones as a preventive measure. Um, I can talk about that. I, we've done some research in that area of people listening through headphones on, you know, with their, with their phone on a, on a um, public transport and putting in earbuds while they're listening. People turn the volume up very highly because there's noise, you know, the noise of the bus or whatever. Um, you, you, you need to turn the volume up to hear your music. And it causes people to potentially do real serious damage to their ears, even, even if they're traveling for say half an hour to work, half an hour home in the evening, they can get as much noise, as much damage doing that as they would if they were working in a factory. So, um, so yeah, noise canceling headphones or even just the kind, the earbuds that seal into your ear canal, the ones with the little rubber ends that you push into your ear and it doesn't let other sound in as much. Um, either noise canceling or that are, are a good idea, I'd say. Dinukshi's put a noise act in the chat. What's that about, Dinukshi? Uh, hi, Dr. Wells and Iranti. Hi. Uh, yes, uh, so uh, adding a little bit uh, to what Iranti just told about uh, religious places, um, uh, noise uh, control and all that. So uh, still, I know that uh, we have some noise regulations on paper, but these are not really implemented. So mm. actually, uh, as uh, Prof. Welch said, I mean, it is a little bit of a sensitive area um, and uh, it could lead to other unforeseen <laughs> issues. Um, so uh, I just sent this... Um, 
regulation act uh, which is given by the uh, environmental authority uh, but uh, actually we should make uh, the necessary steps to implement uh, these uh, laws or regulations at least to some extent if not uh, to the exact extent um, so that is uh, adding a little bit on to that thank you mm, thank you hi Aranti. um since we don't have more questions uh from our audience. I just thought I'll share uh, what I recently saw in Facebook. Uh, there was a video where um, a, a group uh, uh, all are wearing headphones. Um, I think it's uh, in a wedding. So all are wearing headphones and the DJ is uh, you know, sharing uh, the music uh, through the Bluetooth. Uh, to all the headphones. So the person yeah. who recorded it, like it's mute, but everyone is dancing. It, uh, yeah. So so I think uh, I think we, we should look into that aspect and uh, maybe not to suggest uh, such thing um, for the clubs because they also cater different uh, aspects um, uh, uh, for the people when they come to the nightclubs, but maybe uh, to other uh, programs like weddings or the parties, isn't it? What do you think? What do you think, Aranti? Yeah, it's a good idea, Dumini, because again, it's uh, it will not uh, because we are changing the approach that we are using to listen. So without harming others, uh, that will not uh, like up to a certain ex extent that will not limit your personal uh, space of listening to music. Uh, but uh, on the other hand, we are say uh, we are saving the others. We are making sure others are safe. That who doesn't, who don't want to be involved in uh, those sort of those, those sort of a scenario. Um, so maybe you could uh, add this as a future direction to your research, Prof. David. Yeah, it's an interesting <laughs> idea, isn't it? You could it does it does give more people choice about their exposure to the the music, which is nice. Silent discos, as as you say. 